Hello everyone and welcome back. This is the second of two episodes on implementing FIR filters on the STM32. In this video we will look at a few different ways we can speed up the data throughput of the filters and then we will measure their performance, uh, specifically the max sample rates they support. Continuing from the previous video, our system is configured like this. Samples are automatically moved from the ADC to the ADC buffer via DMA, where they are stored in integer format. Then, they are cast into floats and stored in the filter in buffer. Next, they're passed to the FIR filter and stored in the filter out buffer. And finally, the samples are casted back to integers and stored in the DAC buffer, where eventually the DMA controller will send them back to the DAC. As you can probably notice, we are spending valuable computation time performing operations to cast the data back and forth between integers and floats. Therefore, you might ask, is there a way to remove all of the casting operations and speed up the filtering process? And that answer is yes. A more efficient block diagram would look like this, where now samples are stored directly in the ADC and DAC buffers as floats, and thus no casting is necessary. The code changes required for such an implementation are as follows. First, the filter in and filter out buffers we used previously have been removed, and now the ADC and DAC buffers are initialized as floats. Next, in the DMA start function calls, I am passing the ADC and DAC buffers in, not as floats, but as an unsigned int. And lastly, within the callback functions, I have removed the two for loops and instead modified the filter processing functions to directly read from the ADC buffer and write to the DAC buffer. Now, I will once again return to the same project from the previous video in the cube IDE and modify the code to reflect these changes. Additionally, I will import the same low-pass filter coefficients that we created in the previous video with the tfilter tool. And finally, I will build the project, program the STM32 once again, and take a look at the frequency response of our newly optimized filter. After generating another Bode plot, we can see that sure enough, the low-pass filter works with our newly modified code. So, the next question is, if the low-pass filter works, then what about our bandpass filter? Well, as we saw in the previous video, to get the bandpass filter, or high-pass, any filter that cuts out DC, to work correctly, we need to add a DC offset to each of the data points returned from the FIR filter. Additionally, we found that if we wanted to apply a DC offset of 1.5 volts, we needed to add an integer value of 1861 to each sample. So let's try this again, but with our newly optimized system. The new code with the DC offset correction will look like this. First, I will define a new float variable labeled DC offset and assign it a value of 1861. Next, within the callback functions, I will add a for loop after the filter processing function and iterate through each value in the DAC buffer to add the value of the DC offset. Now, I'll go ahead and implement these changes in the main.c file once again. Additionally, I will import the same bandpass filter coefficients that we created in the previous video with the tfilter tool. Now, I will once again build the project, program the STM32, and switch back to the view from the oscilloscope. 
And after running the Bodhi plot, we can see that the filter is completely busted. <laughs> so what exactly happened here? Well, if we switch to the debug perspective and pull up the values of the ADC and DAC buffers, the story starts to make a little more sense. As we can see, the values stored in the ADC buffer are small, like really small, on the order of 1e to the minus 42 small. So what happened? Why are the values so small? Well, it has, all has to do with how floating point numbers are stored in binary format. Starting from the beginning of the signal chain, when a voltage is sampled by the ADC, it is stored as a 12-bit integer number. Therefore, the actual data is placed within the first 12 bits of the ADC buffer. Likewise, the DAC reads from the first 12 bits of the DAC buffer. Regardless of the type that the buffers are, whether float, int, or something else, the data is read and written to the buffers in the exact same way. This is all fine and well when the buffers were defined as integers, but what exactly is happening when they are floats? One place we can look to find answers is the online IEEE 754 floating point converter. Using this site, we can see exactly what happens when integer values are stored in floating point format and what that means for us. First, let's see what happens when we store an integer value of 1 in a float without going through the process of casting. As we can see, the value stored is not interpreted as 1, but rather about 1.4e to the minus 45. Likewise, when we store a binary value of 4095, which is the maximum value our 12-bit converters can handle, the number is not represented as 4095, but rather about 5.7e to the minus 42. So, since the values are interpreted completely different than what we were expecting, it begs the question, why did the low-pass filter work at all? Well, fortunately for us, it has to do with the fact that our converters are only 12 bits, meaning we are only storing the binary data in the mantisa, which behaves exactly the same as any integer would, with the exception that, for all intents and purposes, it's effectively being multiplied by a scalar. Therefore, since FIR filters are linear time-invariant systems, a scalar multiplication has no actual effect on the system. Since samples are being scaled to a small number when converted by the ADC, then scaled back to normal when converted by the DAC. Likewise, it means that to effectively implement a DC offset, all we must do is scale our 1861 value. So what do we scale it to? Well, looking at the case for a binary value of 1, we can see the answer. Now, I was originally going to explain how the numbers are formulated in floating point format and provide a proof of the scaling. But it's just a little too beyond the scope of this video. So for our purposes, just know that our scalar is equal to a binary value of 1, which for a binary value of 1 is equal to the exponent, or 2 raised to the negative 126, multiplied by the mantissa, which is equivalent to 1 divided by 2 raised to the 23rd, which gives a final value of about 1.4 e to the minus 45. Which we can easily verify by looking at a binary value of 4095. If we take the decimal representation, which is about 5.74 e to the minus 42, and divide by 4095, we arrive at 1.401 e to the minus 45, which is the number which is calculated to be the scalar. Therefore, to fix our DC offset issue, all that needs to be done is to multiply the integer value of 1861 by the 1.401 e to the minus 45 scalar, which gives us a value of about 2.6 e to the minus 42. Now, we can update our bandpass filter code by updating the value of the DC offset to this new scaled number. Now, I will once again build the project, program the STM32, and switch to the view from the oscilloscope. After running a new Bode plot, we can see that the bandpass filter works once again. Thus, by defining the ADC and DAC buffers as floats, and with a little smarts, we were successfully able to remove two steps in the signal chain without affecting the performance of the filter, which we will see in a few minutes greatly sped up the overall computation time. This now begs the question, is there anything else we can do to make filtering even faster? And in the case of a bandpass filter, that answer is yes. Currently, a large inefficiency exists due to the way that we are adding the DC offset to each of the DAC buffer indices. To speed up this process, we must ditch the for loop. Fortunately, once again the CMSYS DSP library has our back. Instead of using a for loop to index through the buffer, this time we can use the vector addition function. Honestly, this may be the most basic function in the entire library. All that's necessary to use the function are four inputs. 
a pointer to each of the vectors we wish to add, a pointer to the output vector, and the size of each vector. Thus, our new code looks like this. First, in addition to defining the DC offset variable, I also created an array named offset, which will be one of the inputs into the vector addition function. Next, within the user code begin to section, I iterate through the array and assign the value of the DC offset to each index. Finally, within the callback function, I replace the for loops with our new vector addition function. Now, all that's left for us to do is compare the relative performance of these filters. However, first, I want to give a brief warning about reading and writing data from the converters into floating point variables. Specifically, when working with filter coefficients in floating point format, the coefficients are all less than 1, with some being as small as 0 .001. This can become a problem if the data being read on the ADC is also significantly small. As an example, consider the multiplication operation that takes place during convolution. Starting from a mantis value of 1, or 1.4 e to the minus 45, if we multiply this by our 0 0.001 filter tap value, we create a value so small that it cannot be stored in the filter. It is just stored as 0. Therefore, when reading and writing directly to floating point buffers, be cautious of working with small values close to 0. Fortunately, by naturally using a DC offset, it is easy to avoid this problem altogether. Lastly, with those tutorials out of the way, let's turn our attention to analyzing the speeds of each of the different filtering systems and make some estimations about the max sample rate that the filters can support. Specifically, let's compare the execution time to required to process one block of data for each method. This processing time will include not just the FIR filter, but also includes casting, adding DC offsets, or whatever else is required for the filter to operate correctly. So, in the order that they were addressed, First, we have the low-pass filter where data was stored in the ADC buffer as an integer, then stored as a float in the filter buffers, filtered, converted back to an integer, then placed in the DAC buffer. The second system is almost the same as the first, except now the low-pass filter has been replaced with a bandpass, and thus an additional stage has been added to apply the DC offset. The third system is the low-pass filter again, but now data is stored in the buffers as floats and not integers, which means that all of the code used for casting has been removed. The fourth is just like the previous, but now the filter is a bandpass, and there's an additional step of adding the DC offset. In this case, the offset is added through the use of a for loop. And the fifth and final system is the exact same as before, but now, instead of using a for loop to add the DC offset, we are using the vector addition function from the CMSYS DSP library. To record the execution time required for each data block, I will be using timer2 and making the following additions to the main.c file. First, I'll define a 32-bit unsigned integer to hold the timer value. Second, I'll add a line of code to start timer 2. And third, within the half-complete callback function where the data is processed, as soon as the function is called, I will reset the value of timer 2 to 0. Then, allow the code to process one block of data. And then finally, read the value of the timer to see how long the processing took. Now, I'm not going to show this, but I measured the execution time for all five systems we discussed with a varying number of taps and block sizes. So starting with system three, which is the fastest and most ideal system, I generated the following set of data. As you can see, there are six tables, each with a differing number of filter coefficients starting from 24 all the way up to 64. Within each table, the independent variable is the block size equal to half n or how many samples are being fed into the FIR filter processing function each run. The next column is the timer value, AKA the clock cycles required to process one block. Obviously the larger the block being passed in the processing system, the larger the time required for processing. Next, by knowing the sample rate, the block size, and the time required, I calculated the number of clock cycles required to process 100,000 samples, which we can use in the future for resource budgeting. Finally, again, using our known variables, I calculated the max sampling frequency that the filter can support on my STM32G4, which has a max clock frequency of 170 megahertz. I then repeated this for all five systems. Now, with all that data acquired, let's compare the different systems and see how they perform. Starting with the two low-pass filters, on the left we have our first system, where samples were stored as integers and had to be casted, and on the right we have our fast low-pass filter, where samples were stored directly as floats. As we can see by removing those for loops, we've greatly raised the ceiling for the max sample rate that can be adequately processed. The first system's max rate with a 24 tap filter is about 1.15 mega samples per second. And on the third system, we have nearly 2 mega samples per second. That's a non negligible performance increase. Additionally, you can see that the actual size of our buffers, aka the number of samples we are feeding into the processing function each time, plays a role in performance as well. Specifically, the larger the block size, the faster the filter. 
By looking at these charts, we can reach the conclusion that for maximum efficiency, a block size of less than 100 should not be used. Here is the same comparison as before, but now we are looking at the bandpass filters. So each of these systems has the extra stage in them where the DC offset is added to each sample. And finally, we have a comparison for the two floating point bandpass filters, where on the left we added the DC offset with a for loop, and on the right we used the vector addition function courtesy of the CMSYS DSP library. And as you could have guessed, the vector addition function is significantly faster. By looking at the bottom graphs, we can see that we are cutting out close to 5 million extra clock cycles for each 100,000 samples. Lastly, let's look at a clock budget example. So this is our system 3, our floating point low pass filter, and say we set our converters to 500 kilohertz, have a block size of 512, and are using a 64 tap filter. And we want to know how many other clock cycles we have each second to do some other processing or computationally intensive task. Well, if we take our number of clock cycles per 100,000 samples and we multiply it by our desired 500,000 samples per second number, we can calculate that we'll be using about 107 million clock cycles each second to run the low pass filter. So if we implemented this filter and then wanted to do something else with the stream of data post filtering, maybe take a Fourier transform, run it through a matched filter, some kind of demodulation, we then know we have a little more than 60 million clock cycles to do these other operations with. And that's it. Thanks everyone for watching.